On June the 6th, 1944, the Allies launched their long-awaited invasion of the German-held coast of France. The offensive, codenamed Operation Overlord, had been in preparation for more than two years. The volume of shipping alone was the greatest ever assembled. The Allies also possessed overwhelming superiority in the air, not only in terms of numbers, but in the sheer technical excellence of their aircraft. No other military operation in history boasted such a wealth of hardware. No other operation was so intricately planned. The Battle of Normandy was the last of the great set-piece engagements of World War II. It was also the most important battle ever fought by the Western Allies. Had they failed in Normandy, the future of Europe would have been settled between rival tyrannies on the Eastern Front. Victory not only ensured the ultimate defeat of Germany, but the restoration of freedom and democracy to the conquered populations of the West. Yet the invasion was one of the riskiest operations ever mounted. The French coast was known to be strongly defended, and behind the fortifications of the Atlantic Wall were some of the most formidable divisions in the German army. The Waffen SS was to play a crucial role in the battle. Between June and August, the SS and its supporting infantry formations would hold the Allies within a virtually static lodgment. The battle was the swan song of many of these divisions. Some would be rebuilt and would take part in the last battles of the Reich, but they would never again fight with the skill and determination that marked their defense of Normandy. Defeat in France was a catastrophe for Germany, more damaging to morale than any comparable reverse on the Eastern Front. It marked the beginning of the end for all but the most blindly loyal of Hitler's soldiers. After Normandy, the outcome of the war was no longer in doubt. By 1943, the grey tide of German arms had at last begun to recede. In Russia, it had been checked and then reversed at the Battle of Stalingrad. The failure to hold the city rendered the Caucasus and most of the Donbass indefensible. In the face of continuing Soviet offensives, the Germans withdrew westwards, evacuating the Caucasus and abandoning much of the Donbass. During the spring, the German armies in Russia reinforced and re-equipped. Preparations were made to resume the offensive in the summer, but this time there would be no great blitzkrieg, no attempt to recover the ground lost in the winter. The objective of the campaign would be to straighten the lines and to wear down the Red Army in a grueling battle of attrition. The focus of the attack was a huge salient around the city of Kursk. The salient was an obvious target, threatening Orel and Kharkov. In anticipation of an attack, the Russians had fortified the salient with a series of defensive lines, 
in places more than 20 miles deep. In July, the offensive was launched with simultaneous attacks from the north and south. But despite a heavy concentration of strength, the attacks failed. And within a few weeks, the Germans were once again in retreat. Soviet counteroffensives now opened on either side of the salient, and soon the whole front was in motion. In the autumn, the Russians seized three important bridgeheads on the Dnieper, and by the end of the year, they had won control of most of the West Bank, recaptured Kiev, and cut off the German forces in the Crimea. The reverses on the Eastern Front were mirrored by equally grave setbacks in the West. In May 1943, the long struggle for North Africa came to an end. The final defeat of the Axis armies in Africa was the first great disaster of German arms in the West, but for Italy, it was an even greater humiliation. She had now lost almost all of her overseas territories and with capitulation in Africa, had surrendered the initiative in the Mediterranean. To capitalize on Italian disarray, Allied planners agreed to a series of limited operations against Italy. The initial target was Sicily. Control of the island would secure the Mediterranean sea lanes, deal a damaging blow to Italian morale, and provide an ideal base for operations against the Italian mainland. The attack was launched on July the 10th. Assault landings took place along a 100-mile stretch of coast between Licata and Syracusa. In most sectors, resistance quickly collapsed, and within a few days, the Allies were firmly established in the southeastern sector of the island. Between the middle of July and the middle of August, the Allies advanced steadily northwards. On July the 22nd, they seized Palermo, cutting off 50,000 troops in the west of the island. Four days later, the remaining Italian forces, supported by German armoured and mechanised units, began a staged withdrawal to the northeast. As the Allies converged on Messina, the Germans established a number of rearguard positions, evacuating the bulk of their own forces, along with 60,000 Italians, across the Straits to Italy. Despite the success of the evacuation, the loss of Sicily proved a devastating blow to Italian morale. Two weeks after the landings, Mussolini was deposed, and the new Italian government began secret negotiations with the Allies. Hitler reacted by sending German troops to Italy, ostensibly to bolster Italian resistance, but in reality, to seize power should Italy attempt to surrender. As the situation grew increasingly more confused and more volatile, Allied intervention became more certain. On September the 3rd, units of the British 8th Army crossed the Straits of Messina and began advancing along the toe of Italy. Six days later, in response to urgent Italian requests for assistance, an Allied invasion force landed in the Gulf of Salerno. The attack precipitated a German seizure of power, and German units already in Italy were sent to Salerno to counter-attack the beachhead. Salerno was to be the first real test for the Allies. The invasion fleet was exposed to air attacks from Luftwaffe bases on the Italian mainland. The beachhead area was flanked by high ground, providing excellent positions for German artillery. 
and the corridor of the Seely River allowed the Germans to mount concentrated armoured thrusts against a broad sector of the beachhead. For a week, the Allies clung tenaciously to their lodgment. German counter-attacks were broken up by naval gunfire, directed either visually or by shore-based observers. Despite harassment from the air and the loss of two cruisers, the warships stood firm, eventually forcing a German withdrawal. While the battle for Salerno was at its height, the Eighth Army was pressing slowly northwards. On September the 20th, contact with the Fifth Army was established west of Salerno, but by then, the German withdrawal was already well underway. The Italian campaign was to last until the end of the war. From Salerno, the Germans conducted a fighting retreat northwards, before settling for the winter behind the formidable defences of the Gustav Line. By the end of the year, the Mediterranean had been largely relegated to a secondary theatre of operations. Although Rome still remained in German hands, the central objectives of the campaign had been achieved. Italy had ceased to play an active part in the war, and up to 80 Italian divisions had either been disarmed or interned by the Germans. To hold what remained of the country, Hitler would have to commit forces that might be better employed in the east or in the defense of France. Despite his reputation as Britain's outstanding wartime leader, Churchill was no great strategist, tending to confuse purely military objectives with political goals. Indeed, it was in the world of politics and diplomacy that Churchill both excelled and served his country best. Recognizing that the defeat of Germany could only be guaranteed with the active military support of America, he took every opportunity to press Britain's case. In 1941, he obtained vital agreements on preferential military aid, recognition of mutual interests and aspirations, and in the event of America being drawn into the conflict, a firm commitment to a common set of war aims. Churchill was the driving force behind the campaign in the Mediterranean. But like all of his ventures, it was founded more on political considerations than on military logic. Italy, he regarded as the key to the region, to control of Greece and the Balkans, and to the security of Britain's interests in the Middle East. Churchill's commitment to Operation Overlord was always conditioned by wider strategic considerations. From 1942, he believed that the defeat of Germany was assured and that the fragile alliance with Russia would prove short-lived. The future containment of Soviet expansion would, in his view, be best achieved by a concentration of effort in the Mediterranean even at the expense of postponing Overlord until 1945. By 1940, Roosevelt had become convinced that America's long-term interests were directly threatened by Axis ambitions. Although neutrality still remained the guiding principle of American foreign policy, Roosevelt from this time onwards exerted every influence to lend assistance to Britain and to prepare America for a conflict that he believed was inevitable. In July, within weeks of the capitulation of France, 
he signed the Two Ocean Navy Act, initiating a major expansion of American naval power. In September, he introduced conscription with the Selective Service Act, and in March of the following year, he inaugurated Lend-Lease, an arrangement by which Britain and later Russia would receive military aid denied to the Axis. As a full partner in the alliance, Roosevelt remained true to the commitments he had given Churchill, concentrating the main weight of American arms against the European Axis powers. For Roosevelt, the defeat of Germany as the senior Axis partner was an overriding priority, and his preferred strategy was for an early invasion of France. In 1942, he was dissuaded from this by Churchill, and in 1943, by America's growing involvement in the war against Italy. Nevertheless, he remained a firm advocate of a cross-channel attack and regarded the Mediterranean as a diversion. After Stalingrad, Hitler knew he faced the prospect of a long and exhausting war in the East. He had suffered defeats in the past, but the setbacks of 1943 had gravely weakened his armies, undermined morale, and placed additional burdens on the already stretched resources of the Reich. Yet he still believed himself marked by providence. Victory was not yet beyond his grasp. In the East, he determined to hold fast, fighting for every town and village, while preparing for what he believed would be the decisive battle in the West. If he could win a crushing victory there, he could restore morale both at home and in the army, and with the forces released, settle his final accounts with the Russians. Hitler was under no illusion as to where the battle would take place. In 1942, he had known that the Allies were not yet strong enough to mount a serious attack on the French coast. In 1943, he had judged that the campaign in the Mediterranean would take up most of the available Allied resources. But he was also aware that Italy offered only a long and tortuous road to the Reich and that the Mediterranean was no more than a diversion. The main Allied campaign of the war, he knew, was yet to begin, and it would take place not in Italy, but in France. Outline plans for a cross-channel attack had been drawn up as early as December 1941, and within weeks, regular American forces had been embarked for England. There, they would be joined by advance units of the newly designated American 8th Air Force, a mixed command of fighters and bombers charged with pursuing the air war against Germany. This build-up of men and material was recognized as an essential first step to an invasion of France. In 1942, however, insufficient forces were available for an operation of this magnitude, and most of those arriving would later serve in the Mediterranean. In 1943, the Mediterranean remained the principal theater of operations, but the build-up of men and equipment in Britain continued. At the end of the year, Allied plans for a cross-channel attack took a step nearer to realization. At the Tehran conference, the decision was taken to launch Overlord no later than the summer of 1944.
The area selected for the landings was a sector of the Normandy coastline within range of Allied fighter cover mounted from bases in Britain. The Calvados coast was part of the Great Bay of the Seine and enjoyed the advantages of good beaches and comparatively sheltered waters. Assault landings would be made on five separate beaches. In the west, American forces would land at Utah and Omaha beaches. In the east, the British and Canadians would land at Gold, Juneau and Sword beaches. Airborne forces would be deployed on the flanks, inland of Utah and on either side of the River Orne. The objectives of the first day were to link up the five separate beachheads into one continuous lodgment, five to ten miles deep, to secure the principal roads and river crossings and to throw a cordon round the city of Caen. In the days immediately following, supplies and reinforcements would be brought ashore and the lodgement extended and strengthened. While the principal objective in the east would be the consolidation of Caen, the principal American objective would be the isolation and capture of Cherbourg. This would provide vital harbourage and an extensive rear area for the disembarkation and assembly of follow-up forces. The main thrusts of the offensive would then be mounted from the base of the Cotentin Peninsula towards Brittany and from Caen towards Paris. To ensure the success of Overlord, air and naval support was seen as crucial. Naval forces would be required for mine clearance, convoy escort and fire support. But in the months preceding the invasion, their primary task would be to secure control of the sea lanes between Britain and the continent. These operations were complemented by air attacks on enemy shipping and by attacks on ports and harbours on the continental coast. From the end of 1943, Allied air power was primarily focused on the wider objectives of Overlord. The transportation plan, adopted by Allied planners as the most effective means of furthering these aims, called for a systematic offensive against the infrastructure of France and the Low Countries. Initially, this offensive would be concentrated on the railway system, the marshalling yards, repair shops and major junctions. But as D-Day approached, the scope of operations would be widened to include all transport targets, as well as signals, communications and radar networks. The purpose of the plan was to paralyze the enemy's command and communication systems, to isolate the Normandy beachhead, and to prevent the rapid deployment of reinforcements and reserves. During the battle itself, air power would play a key role, providing fighter support, close reconnaissance, and roving artillery. Hitler's strategy for the defense of France rested primarily on a series of coastal fortifications known as the Atlantic Wall. Construction of the wall had begun early in 1942, when the prospect of an invasion was still distant. Priority at this time was given to the protection of military installations and major ports. Work on the wall continued throughout 1943, but with the concentration of Allied forces in the Mediterranean, there was little sense of urgency. Plans for a continuous belt of fortifications were still largely unrealized, and the wall was in most sectors far from complete. Then in December, Hitler ordered that work on the wall be stepped up. 
priority henceforth was to be given to the defense of the West. German strategic planning was based on a number of assumptions. The first was that landings would most likely be made within range of fighter cover from bases in England. This circumscribed an area from the Gulf of Saint Malo to the Dutch coast. A second assumption was that the Allies would try to seize harbour facilities for the quick reinforcement of their assault forces. These were most extensive in the ports of the Pas de Calais. An attack here would benefit from the greatest depth of fighter cover, require the shortest transit time from Britain to the continent, and provide an ideal springboard for a rapid advance into Germany. Yet while this formed their basic underlying strategy, the Germans were also aware of the possibility of support or diversionary landings, and of the Allies' ability to provide air cover from carriers, and they were consequently compelled to maintain large forces in comparatively quiet sectors of the coast. For such a broad deployment to be effective, it was imperative that the landings be contested from the outset at the water's edge. Every beach between Denmark and the Brittany coast was to be made impassable. Civilian, military and conscript labour would be called upon. Thousands of new artillery, machine gun and mortar positions were to be built by April at the latest. Every port and harbour was to be turned into a fortress and the garrison supplied with sufficient stores to withstand a siege. Priority was to be given to the Pas de Calais. During the first few months of 1944, immense efforts were made to strengthen the coastal defences in anticipation of an attack in the spring or summer. Naval batteries and heavy artillery were housed in nearly impregnable concrete bunkers. Many of these guns were capable of ranging far out to sea and engaging the most heavily armed warships. On the beaches themselves, an intricate array of hazards, obstacles and traps was set out. Behind these were minefields, anti-tank ditches and ramps, blockhouses and entanglements of barbed wire. By the end of May, the fortifications in the Pas de Calais would be almost complete. Those in the Normandy sector, while still far from complete, were nevertheless formidable. During April and May, German armoured formations in the west were augmented by transfers from the Eastern Front and by the arrival of new tanks and self-propelled guns from Germany. As D-Day approached, German strength in the west increased from 53 to 57 divisions. These were distributed between four armies in France and Belgium, an army corps in Holland with its own separate command, and a panzer reserve deployed behind the lines with its headquarters near Paris. In addition to this, the third air fleet maintained around a thousand aircraft of all types. These would be joined by immediate transfers from Germany in the event of an invasion. These then were the forces available to Hitler on the eve of battle. The strategy for defense was as yet flexible. No one knew for certain where the Allies would strike. The first and principal line of defense was of necessity the coast itself. Behind the Atlantic Wall lay the four armored divisions of Panzer Group West. 
If the wall was breached, their task would be to counterattack and contain the lodgment while forces were transferred from other sectors and, if necessary, from other fronts. In 1942, Eisenhower was sent to England to oversee the build-up of American forces in preparation for an eventual cross-channel attack. In this role, he had proved himself an excellent organiser and a skillful diplomat. As supreme commander in the Mediterranean in 1943, Eisenhower's task was to weld the many different nationalities into an effective fighting force. Eisenhower's management of this campaign further confirmed his reputation as an organiser, conciliator and motivator. It was these characteristics that most marked his command during the preparatory phases of Overlord. Planning was thorough the organization of logistics and supply meticulous, and overall strategy worked out in full consultation with colleagues and subordinates. As a field commander, Eisenhower was aware of his limitations and relied extensively on the experience and abilities of others, appointing Air Marshal Tedder as his deputy and General Montgomery as his land forces commander. Although Montgomery would direct the battle on the ground, Eisenhower would nevertheless retain executive authority and would bear ultimate responsibility for the success or failure of the enterprise. As one of the Wehrmacht's most experienced and respected officers, Gerd von Rundstedt was a popular choice as Commander-in-Chief West, but his task was far from enviable. Too often, requests for men and equipment were ignored, and his operational authority was constrained by Hitler's specific directives for the defense of France. In particular, Rundstedt had grave doubts about the value of Hitler's Atlantic Wall. Reports from Italy had indicated that coastal defences were no match for warships and that counterattacks in coastal areas could be broken up by naval gunfire. Rundstedt's own preferences were for a defence in depth, maintaining the strongest possible force as a strategic reserve. This view, however, found little favour with Hitler, and Rundstedt's room for manoeuvre was further compromised by the appointment of Erwin Rommel as Commander-in-Chief of Army Group B. Rommel believed that in the absence of adequate air support, the coastal fortifications provided the key to the defence of the West. The success or failure of the initial landings would determine the outcome of the battle. Rommel's prestige was almost equal to that of Rundstedt. Moreover, he too had direct access to Hitler, a complication in the chain of command that could only augur ill for Rundstedt's control of the battle. The successful breakout from Salerno, in addition to boosting Allied morale, enabled assault shipping to be transferred from the Mediterranean to Britain. For a contested landing on the French coast, warships, transports and landing craft would be required in numbers hitherto inconceivable. the 5,300 vessels that would form the invasion fleet, 
roughly a quarter were warships. Chief among these were the battleships, cruisers and destroyers of the bombarding force. In support of landings in the Mediterranean, they had demonstrated a deadly combination of accurate and heavy gunfire. This would be the battering ram that would breach Hitler's Atlantic Wall. In the air, the preparations for Overlord continued to gather pace. In 1943, the United States 8th Air Force had been joined by the 9th, a tactical command transferred from the Mediterranean. In 1944, these forces, in association with the RAF, initiated a major campaign of high-profile attacks on vital strategic targets both in France and Germany. The objective was to draw the Luftwaffe to battle and so secure absolute dominance in the skies over Europe. By the spring of 1944, Allied preparations for a cross-channel invasion were nearly complete. The build-up of men and equipment in Britain was reaching its climax. Hardly a town or county remained unaffected. Everywhere, ordnance depots, tank parks and supply dumps proliferated. One of the best fighter aircraft of the war, the North American P-51 Mustang, was the remarkable product of British and American collaboration. Built in America to British specifications and with a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine, it outperformed every other fighter then in service. In sweeps over Europe in the months leading up to D-Day, it would contribute decisively to the destruction of the Luftwaffe as an effective fighting force. The Hawker Typhoon was originally designed as a pure fighter, a replacement for the now obsolete Hawker Hurricane. But it was as a ground attack aircraft that the Typhoon and its later variant, the Tempest, were to excel. Both aircraft were configured to carry racks of wing-mounted rockets. These were cheap to produce and could be fitted with either armor-piercing or high-explosive warheads. Rockets transformed the offensive potential of these aircraft, enabling targets to be attacked with near pinpoint accuracy. Of the many varieties of amphibious assault craft available to the Allies, the largest and most indispensable was the landing ship. These vessels marked a revolution in maritime technology. In contrast to the landing craft, the landing ship was a fully seaworthy vessel, yet it performed an essentially similar function and on a vastly greater scale. Like the landing craft, the landing ship could be adapted for a variety of roles, but its principal function was the transportation of troops and tanks directly from their port of embarkation to the beachhead. Landing ships had only entered service in 1943, but had already demonstrated their value during the invasions of Sicily and Italy. On D-Day, over 300 of these vessels would be available. They would be the workhorses of beachhead reinforcement and supply. The American M4, or Sherman as it was known in Britain, began coming off the production lines in March 1942 
and quickly became the standard battle tank in both the American and British armies. Although poorly armed in comparison to German tanks, the M4 was cheap and easy to manufacture, and vast numbers were available for the invasion. Variants included the Sherman Firefly, an upgunned M4 designed for tank duels. The duplex drive had a waterproofed hull and was equipped with a flotation screen and propeller for amphibious assault. M4s were also modified as engineering vehicles for beach or minefield clearance. In coastal areas, the final training of assault troops was underway. As D-Day approached, the exercises were made more complex and realistic. Beachhead management and control assumed greater importance. Assault parties were trained to engage pillboxes and bunkers, and naval shore parties to coordinate fire support. This phase of the battle would almost certainly be the most crucial, and many of the men who would land with the initial wave were veterans of several campaigns. Others were regular army and had been training and preparing for years, but of those in the following waves, the vast majority had yet to be tested in action. Their contribution might prove to be equally crucial. No one could fully anticipate the course of the battle to come. Divisions might be fed into an advance or thrown into a last-ditch defense of the beachhead. For these reasons, many of the follow-up forces were also trained in assault landings, in attack and defense, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and in the techniques of assaulting fortified positions. Among all the services, morale was high. There was a feeling of common purpose and a sense that the war in Europe was reaching its supreme climax. Official secrecy ensured that only a few knew the actual date and place of the landings, but all were aware that D-Day was imminent. All of the essential preconditions for a cross-channel attack had been met Allied air and naval superiority was complete. The men were well trained and equipped. Many were apprehensive, but all shared a fundamental confidence in their collective ability and in the ultimate success of the enterprise. Since Stalingrad, the German army had been fighting a largely defensive war in the east. The loss in that campaign of almost half a million men, as well as vast quantities of equipment, gravely undermined its offensive capability. The subsequent destruction of the German forces in Africa and the war of attrition in Italy only served to further diminish this once formidable war machine. Yet neither then, nor in 1944, was there any fundamental revision of the German order of battle. Instead of reducing the number of field divisions and redeploying along a shorter and more defensible frontage, the divisions themselves were reorganized and their establishment strengths reduced from nine to six battalions. Even divisions that had been utterly destroyed were reconstituted with skeleton cadre and slotted back into the order of battle.
divisional frontages remained unchanged, as did the operational demands placed upon them. This, coupled with a strategy of no withdrawal and a chronic shortage of reserves, was to place a heavy burden on fighting troops in every theatre of the conflict. In Normandy, the 7th Army was similarly composed of understrength divisions, many of which were ill-equipped and included units unsuitable for anything other than static defence. This situation was only partly redeemed by Rommel's emphasis on fixed fortifications and the rapid deployment of armour. Even as late as 1944, the backbone of German panzer divisions remained the Mark IV battle tank. Originally designed in the 1930s as an infantry support tank, the Mark IV proved to be a superb machine, sound, reliable and supremely versatile. From 1941, the Mark IV was given additional armour and re-equipped with successively heavier armament. The original 75mm howitzer was replaced in 1942 by a 75mm long-barreled gun. This in turn was superseded in 1943 by a longer-barreled high-velocity weapon. Progressive improvements in armour were made possible by the superiority of the basic design. Between 1941 and 1944, protection was doubled, and despite an increase in weight of several tonnes, there was no significant loss of speed or manoeuvrability. The Mark IV also proved eminently suited to field refits, and many machines were upgraded in service. The Mark V, or Panther, first appeared in 1943. Originally inspired by the superlative Soviet T-34, it was designed and produced from prototype in less than a year. Early production Panthers suffered from a number of design defects and proved unreliable in service, but when these faults were corrected, the tank quickly established itself as a fearsome fighting machine. With heavy, sloping armour and a powerful 75mm gun, the Panther was more than a match for any Allied tank. By 1944, the Panther was beginning to replace the ageing Mark IV as the main battle tank in service with the Wehrmacht. The Mark VI, or Tiger tank, was available only in small numbers. These were normally grouped in independent tank battalions, attached to division or corps. Although the Tiger was the most heavily armoured and powerfully gunned of all German tanks, it lacked manoeuvrability and optimal performance depended on careful maintenance and a highly trained crew. This, combined with its weight, limited range and slow speed, made it more suitable for defence than attack. But deployed in support of fixed defences, even limited numbers of Tigers could make an immense contribution to the battle. Despite the setbacks and reverses of 1943, morale within the German army still remained high. Among frontline units, there was a conscious recognition of past achievements, a high level of professionalism, and a wealth of experience. Bonds of comradeship formed in training 
had been tested in the gravest of adversities. This was especially true of the Waffen-SS. In the East, the SS had demonstrated a fanatical determination, proving as resolute in defense as they were vigorous in attack. In 1944, the SS Panzer Divisions were the only units in the army maintained at or near establishment in armor and men. Rundstedt would have six such divisions for the Battle of Normandy. It was upon these that he and many of his officers pinned their strategies and their hopes. By 1944, the Allies had established a massive lead in the clandestine war of intelligence gathering and deception. While German reconnaissance flights flown over Britain had virtually ceased, those flown over occupied Europe by the Allies were growing more numerous every day. Yet aerial reconnaissance provided only a part of the volume of information that helped to formulate and refine Allied plans. A wealth of information came from the occupied territories themselves. In the preceding years, the resistance networks had been armed and organized by British agents. Almost all were equipped with radio transmitters. Information gathered by the networks was often of immense value. Reports from the resistance kept Allied planners abreast of every development. The location of fuel and ammunition dumps, enemy troop strengths and morale, and the existence of camouflaged installations, often invisible from the air. In May alone, nearly 4,000 such reports were sent to England. Some networks were inevitably discovered and compromised, but the sheer volume of intelligence gathered more than outweighed the risks involved. Another rich source of information was, ironically, the German army itself. As early as 1940, British intelligence had been regularly decoding German radio ciphers. Such an elaborate system of secrecy surrounded these operations that the German army remained utterly unaware that its security had been so gravely compromised. From these sources, the Allies knew that the Germans expected the invasion to take place in the area of the Pas Calais. To reinforce this belief, and to ensure the continuing commitment of men and resources to the area, they contrived a huge campaign of deception. For every mission flown over Normandy, two were flown over the Pas de Calais. Radio traffic was artificially generated to convince the Germans that this was where they intended to land. Other clues were dropped to suggest diversionary landings would be made in Norway and in the west of France. To support these efforts, naval operations, including naval reconnaissance and minesweeping, were conducted with equal or greater thoroughness in the Straits of Dover and in the North Atlantic waters between Scotland and Norway. Even when the Allies landed in Normandy, it was hoped that these measures would still have residual consequences, causing the German high command to hesitate, suspect Normandy of being a diversion, and maintain the concentration of troops in the Pas de Calais. In May, 
the air offensive was further escalated with systematic low-level attacks on a range of secondary targets in France and the Low Countries. These included individual transportation targets, enemy headquarters, radar and communication systems, airfields and bridges, and ammunition, fuel and supply dumps. To ensure security and to reinforce the campaign of deception, the offensive was mounted on a broad front with the greatest concentration of attacks falling in the area of the Pas-de-Calais. Simultaneously, resistance activity was stepped up. These operations, though necessarily limited and highly localized in nature, helped to further disable the transport and communication systems and to tie up significant German forces that could be more profitably employed in coastal defense. In mid-May, with impeccable timing, the last strategic deception began to unfold. In Italy, the Allied armies began their long-prepared offensive against the Gustav Line. By the end of May 1944, all of the essential preconditions for a cross-channel attack had been met. In the Atlantic and in the waters between Britain and the continent, Allied naval power was supreme. In the skies over France and the Low Countries, their air forces had achieved almost total mastery. In the months leading up to D-Day, the transportation offensive had been pressed with mounting intensity. Throughout northwest France, hardly a bridge remained intact. The radar and communication system was in ruins, and the third air fleet reduced to little more than a skeleton formation. In Britain, the long period of preparation was coming to an end. The assembly of men and equipment was complete. Training programs were being wound down, final rehearsals conducted, and the men briefed. In Italy, the Allies had captured the forbidding redoubt of Monte Cassino, turned the Gustav line, and at last broken into the Liri Valley, By the end of the month, they were advancing on a broad front. The capture of Rome was now only a matter of time. The month of June opened auspiciously for the Allies. For the Germans, it promised only further exhausting battles and a remorseless, steady withering of their strength in every theater of operations. In early May, Allied planners had set a target date for the landings of June the 5th. This promised the most favorable conjunction of tide, weather, and moonlight. As D-Day approached, the complex machinery of mobilization was set in motion. The first task was to assemble the assault formations close to their ports of embarkation in southern England. This was a massive operation, requiring close cooperation between the various military and civil authorities and conducted amid the tightest security. Assembly areas were sealed off, ports and harbors placed under military control, and civilian movements highly restricted. Equipment and supplies were loaded first, then, at the end of May, the men began going aboard. 
everything had been planned down to the last detail. On the first day, enough men and equipment had to be put ashore to fight a major campaign, to repel any counter-offensives and to clear and secure the landing areas for the safe disembarkation of the following waves. Of the 50 divisions stationed in Britain, eight were selected for the initial landings. These would be reinforced by elements of a further four. Also landing on D-Day would be three independent armoured brigades, three airborne divisions and two brigades of special forces. By June the 3rd, the embarkation of the assault force was complete and the armada readied to sail. But then, on the following day, the weather forecasters predicted a gathering channel storm. High winds, low clouds and heavy seas would combine in the target area on the 5th. Air support would be impossible, landing of troops hazardous, and in the heaving seas, naval gunfire would be undependable. Eisenhower agreed to a postponement of 24 hours, but any further postponement would be impossible. If the Armada did not sail on the 6th, it would not be able to sail for at least another fortnight. Ships at sea would have to return to port for refueling. Not until the 20th would the tides again be favourable. The men would need to be disembarked, morale would suffer and security would be lost. The world would soon learn that something had gone wrong. As the storm swept through the channel, the forecasters now predicted a slight break in the weather for the morning of the 6th. The weather window was not expected to last for more than 24 hours, but Eisenhower was aware that the opportunity had to be seized, and early on the 5th, orders were issued to sail. Once taken, the decision to go was irrevocable. Ships at sea could be recalled even at the last possible moment, but the airborne forces were due to land several hours before the infantry and armour. Without support, they would be massacred, and the entire Allied strategy wrecked beyond repair. Everything now depended on a combination of luck and weather. While every effort had been made to obtain the maximum level of surprise, it had always been assumed that the Germans would have at least 12 hours warning. To any lurking U-boat or aerial reconnaissance sweep over the channel, the sheer volume of shipping would be a clear signal that the invasion was underway. In the event, the failure of the Germans to maintain even this level of reconnaissance was to deliver to the Allies a measure of tactical surprise beyond all their expectations. While the invasion flotilla was forming up in the waters off Normandy, the leading elements of the airborne forces were beginning their long journey from England to France. Even now, surprise remained complete. Not until the paratroop and glider landings were fully underway would the Germans have any indication of the force of the blow that was about to fall on them. The naval component of Overlord consisted of two task forces under the overall command of Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey. Ramsey's command included responsibility not only for the assault landings, 
but for the safe and efficient transportation of all follow-up forces. These forces consisted of two armies, each allocated its own coastal sector, yet under the executive direction and control of General Montgomery's 21st Army Group. The American First Army was commanded by General Omar Bradley, a veteran of North Africa and Italy. For the assault on Utah and Omaha beaches, Bradley fielded two divisions, the 4th and the 1st. Although infantry formations, they were highly mechanized and possessed their own armored component. These forces would be reinforced by forward elements of two further divisions, the 90th and the 29th. Behind these were another three divisions, two infantry and one armored. Their task would be to consolidate and expand the lodgment seized by the assault forces. In the eastern sector, the British Second Army was commanded by General Sir Miles Dempsey. Dempsey was a highly respected battlefield commander who had participated in almost every major campaign of the war. Attacking three beaches, Dempsey deployed three infantry divisions, each with its own complement of assault engineers and supported by an independent armored brigade. These boasted tank strengths, almost the equivalent of an armored division. In reserve, and comprising the follow-up force, were a further two infantry and one full armored division. All three were veteran formations. In addition to providing fighter cover and tactical air support throughout the battle, the Allied Expeditionary Air Force was also responsible for the safe transportation and delivery of the airborne forces. Three divisions would be flown in, in stages, over the course of D-Day. Two American divisions, the 82nd and the 101st, would be deployed on the right flank of the battle zone, with the British 6th Airborne on the left. Facing this formidable array of arms were four divisions of the German 7th Army. Of these, three were static formations, composed principally of second-rate forces and equipped purely for defense. Only the 352nd was a properly constituted and combat-hardened field infantry division. 7th Army was commanded by General Friedrich Dolmen, a career soldier who had spent much of the war in France. In Army Reserve, Dolman had three divisions. The closest of these, the 91st, was deployed along the west coast of the Cotentin Peninsula, while the other two, both of them veteran parachute formations, were stationed in Brittany and could take days to reach the battlefield. During this critical period, the onus would be on the mobile divisions of Rommel's Army Group B and on the crack armored and mechanized formations of Panzer Group West. This was nominally under the command of General Geer von Schweppenberg, but in practice could only be deployed on Hitler's authority. Of the three Panzer divisions in Army Group B, one was stationed in Normandy and two were in the Pas de Calais. Those of Panzer Group West were deployed well behind the front, the 1st SS in Belgium and the 17th SS in the west of France. But both the 12th SS and the elite Panzer Lair were stationed close enough to Normandy to be brought quickly to battle. The first Allied soldiers to land in France were advance units and pathfinders of the three airborne divisions. Yet despite the accuracy of the initial landings 
and the efforts of the Pathfinder forces, many of the subsequent landings were widely dispersed. In both sectors, however, sufficient forces were available in the target zones to begin moving on their objectives almost immediately. In these, the first combat encounters of the Battle of Normandy, surprise and confusion were to prove valuable allies. While these actions were going on, the invasion fleet was moving up to the lowering positions, and the warships of the bombarding force ranging their guns on the enemy's coastal fortifications. Initially, shore bombardment would be directed by aerial observation, but amongst the first troops to land would be specially trained shore fire control parties. They would maintain contact between the beachhead and the ship's gunnery control officers, calling down fire where and when it was most needed. Also landing in the initial wave were the assault engineers. Their task was to clear pathways through the minefields and obstacles, to secure safe access to the beach exits for heavy equipment, and to open up routes inland. As the first wave of assault craft closed on the coast, the naval bombardment shifted inland and a final deluge of rockets rained down on the shore. Yet despite the intensity and weight of fire, many of the German defences remained intact. Nowhere was this more true than at Omaha. Here, the surviving fortifications were manned by units of the 352nd Division. Pinned down by small arms and mortar fire, the American forces attacking Omaha were also bludgeoned by artillery batteries sighted well inland and in constant communication with forward observers overlooking the beach. Elsewhere, the landings were more successful. On Utah, the defences were weaker and more thinly garrisoned than on any other beach. German resistance was quickly overwhelmed and the beach secured. In the British sector, the landings were scheduled to take place an hour after the Americans touched down and the naval bombardment was more intense and prolonged. Nevertheless, numerous well-sighted strongpoints remained and the beaches came under heavy fire. On all the British beaches, the modified tanks and specialist engineering vehicles contributed greatly to the success of the initial assault. Throughout the morning of D-Day, clear ways were progressively widened, pillboxes and strongpoints demolished, and the beach exits cleared of debris and obstacles. By midday on June the 6th, the Allies had seized many of their primary objectives and penetrated inland from four of their five beachheads. East of the Orne, the 6th Airborne held a commanding salient some three miles deep and two wide, but from Sword Beach itself, the British had only managed to penetrate a mile inland. This was less than Montgomery had hoped for and would inevitably jeopardize plans to capture Caen on D-Day. On Gold and Juno, the beachheads were more substantial, but pockets of fierce German resistance still remained to be liquidated. At Le Hamel, where a complex of fortified buildings and pillboxes overlooked Gold Beach, one company of the 352nd held out well into the afternoon. In the American sector, 
operations were complicated by problems of terrain. West of the Via, efforts to expand Utah were hindered by a belt of marshes and flooded land lying directly behind the beachhead. Units of the 101st Airborne had captured the western exits of four causeways leading inland from the beach, but these proved too narrow for rapid exploitation. Further west, elements of the 82nd Airborne had seized Sainte Mary Glees, but more than half of the division still remained dispersed, and many of its objectives were still held by the Germans. On Omaha, the situation was critical. Only a small proportion of the assault force had been able to get ashore. No more than a few unfortunate battalions of the 1st and 29th Infantry Divisions. On high ground, overlooking the beach, elements of the 352nd held a number of surviving forward defences. These commanded both the beach and the seaward approaches. None of the exits from the beach had been taken, and American penetration amounted to no more than a few precarious salients. The fate of Omaha hung in the balance for the rest of the day. Offshore, a force of battleships and cruisers laid down a curtain of fire a few miles inland. The objective was to seal off the beachhead and isolate the remaining defenders from any further reinforcement or resupply. Simultaneously, destroyer groups closer inshore attacked strong points and fortifications overlooking the beach. The landing of vehicles and supplies was suspended. Instead, further assault troops and tanks were sent in. By mid-afternoon, the situation on Omaha was no longer quite so critical. Naval gunfire had proved decisive. The forward defences were shattered and American troops were at last pressing inland. Throughout the course of D-Day, only two German fighters were seen over the beachhead. In contrast, Allied air power was brought to bear on the battle with devastating effects. Nearly 15,000 sorties were flown in the first 24 hours. Enemy troop concentrations and armored columns were attacked ceaselessly. The deployment of reserves was disrupted and bottlenecks created by wrecked vehicles caused confusion and delays. At the eastern end of the beachhead, the advance south from Sword was running well behind schedule. 21st Panzer had been mobilized within a few hours of the first airborne landings, but it was not effectively deployed until late in the morning. Elements were sent northeast to counterattack the airhead, and anti tank guns were deployed on high ground commanding the approaches to Caen. The city itself was defended by the panzer artillery, while the main body of armor was directed north towards Sword. Meanwhile, the British armor and infantry were pressing slowly inland. Early in the afternoon, they overran 21st Panzer's anti-tank screen and by four o'clock had reached Biville, only a few miles from Caen. West of them, the Canadians were pressing south from Juneau, but between Juneau and Sword, a four-mile gap still remained to be closed. It was into this corridor that the German tanks drove. In the evening, forward elements of 21st Panzer reached the coast near Luc-sur-Mer, but without support, they were soon forced to withdraw. 
This failure of the Germans to mount a major counteroffensive on the first day, either against Sword or Omaha, was to cost them dearly in the following weeks. As D-Day drew to a close, Allied commanders had cause for quiet confidence. Four defensible beachheads had been established on the French coast, and a fifth, though still vulnerable and under visually directed artillery fire, was being rapidly reinforced and pushed out. A total of 150,000 men had been landed by air and sea at a cost of some 10,000 casualties, only a quarter of whom were killed. The establishment of a single continuous lodgment and the capture of Caen on D-Day had proved too ambitious. In some sectors, particularly that of Omaha, German units had fought with surprising professionalism and courage. 21st Panzer had been stationed closer to the coast than Allied planners had anticipated. Its counter-attack had been unexpected and had blunted the drive for Caen, and although driven off, it had quickly regrouped and now stood between the British and their primary strategic objective. In the days immediately following D-Day, Montgomery's priority was to expand and strengthen the lodgement. The landings were now running between 8 and 12 hours behind schedule, and powerful German armoured formations were known to be moving into the Normandy area. To maintain the momentum of the initial assault, the Allies had to press further inland, the ultimate success of Overlord would depend upon their ability to concentrate forces and supplies in the beachhead more rapidly than the Germans could bring up reinforcements to oppose them. It was imperative to gain depth, to create space for the assembly and organization of follow-up forces, to provide room for maneuver and to establish the logistical infrastructure to support a major campaign. In all sectors, the Allies continued to maintain pressure, pushing out the perimeter of the lodgement while their enemies desperately strove to contain it. By midday on the 7th, the British and Canadians had secured the corridor between Juneau and Sword, establishing a single continuous lodgement between Port-en-Bessin and the mouth of the Orne. From Gold, units of 50 division captured Bayeux, but the road to Caen was to remain closed for many weeks to come. Early on the 7th, forward elements of the 12th SS moved into the line to the left of 21st Panzer and the remnants of the 716th Division. Later that day, these clashed with strong Canadian forces advancing towards Caen. In a series of engagements fought throughout the 7th and the 8th, the Canadians were savagely mauled, their forward units defeated in detail and their offensive thrown back. By the 9th, the 12th SS was firmly established in strong positions to the northwest of Caen. In the American sector, Omaha was to remain vulnerable and isolated for more than two days. Yet during this time, while men and equipment were pouring into the beachhead, no attempt was made by the Germans to reinforce the beleaguered 352nd or to mount a serious counterattack. 
the fierce resistance shown during the landings soon withered. And by the 8th, the Americans had linked up with the British advancing from gold, secured their right flank on the Veer, and were pressing inland. West of the Veer, the Americans were meeting much more determined resistance. After their initial confusion and hesitation, the German forces in the Cotentin rallied strongly. Reserves were quickly mobilized to prevent any further expansion of the Utah beachhead. For the Americans, progress was agonizingly slow. Their airborne forces, due to be relieved once the beachhead was secure, had to be retained and deployed in offensive operations. On June the 11th, units of the 101st Airborne captured Carenton and on the following day linked up with troops from Omaha. By the end of the first week, the Allies were firmly established in Normandy. A further 10 divisions had joined those of the assault wave. From Omaha, the American 1st Division had pressed nearly 20 miles inland. Elsewhere, the gains were more modest. The junction of Utah and Omaha, straddling the Veer, was only a few miles deep, and Panzer Grenadiers of the 17th SS had taken up positions south of Carenton. German strength in this sector now amounted to eight divisions although many of these were either under strength or badly depleted. In the British sector, the capture of Caen remained a distant prospect. Here, the Germans were concentrating the main weight of their armoured reserves. Panzer Lair moved into the line on the 9th, and 2nd Panzer a few days later. On the 13th, an attack by 7th Armoured towards villers bocage was caught between these formations after its spearhead was broken by a battalion of Tiger tanks. Rommel's priority was to hold the line north of Caen. The city was the key to the open plains of northwest France. If the Allies could seize Caen and break out of the Bocage, their superior mobility and their command of the skies would enable them to fight a war of manoeuvre in which the Wehrmacht would be at every disadvantage. During June, four further SS formations were sent to Normandy, the first from Belgium, the second from the south of France, and the ninth and 10th transferred from the Eastern Front three of these would be thrown into the defense of Caen. Most Herculean task facing the British before Caen, the initiative passed to the Americans. Between the 13th and the 16th of June, the Americans seized bridgeheads across the Merderay and Douve rivers. Two days later, they reached Barneville on the west coast, cutting off the German defenders in the Cotentin and isolating Cherbourg. Until Cherbourg could be captured and its port facilities brought into commission, the Allied build-up depended primarily on two artificial harbours. These had been prefabricated in Britain and were towed across the channel in sections. Beachhead assembly began within a few days of the landings, and on June the 17th, the first of these was unloading troops and equipment in the American sector. Construction of the British harbour was slower and was still in progress 
when a severe storm blew up over the channel on the 19th. For three days, the storm lashed against the French coast. Very little could be brought ashore. 800 ships were sunk or beached, and more than 140,000 tons of supplies lost. When it finally abated, the American harbor was wrecked beyond repair, and on all the beaches, the damage was so extensive that supply schedules were in chaos. The British buildup was now three full divisions behind target, and the Americans were so short of ammunition that all further offensive operations in the Omaha sector were suspended. The capture of Cherbourg now commanded the full focus of American efforts. On June the 22nd, after advancing virtually unopposed through the southern Cotentin, the Americans attacked the port's outer defenses. By the 26th, they had broken through to the town. German resistance, though futile, persisted for a further three days, enabling the port and harbor facilities to be systematically demolished. The capture of Cherbourg was to have a number of important consequences for both the Allies and the Germans. Though the harbor facilities would take many weeks of reconstruction before they could be restored to full operating capacity, the clearance of the Cotentin Peninsula would provide a comparatively secure rear area for the disembarkation and assembly of follow-up forces. For the Germans, the capture of the port and the loss of some 40,000 of their troops in the peninsula was a grave blow to the combat strength of 7th Army and to German morale in general. At the eastern end of the lodgement, there was almost complete deadlock. British efforts to dislodge the Germans from Caen had all so far failed, and a major offensive, launched in late June and aimed at outflanking the city from the west, had quickly become bogged down, achieving no more than a small bridgehead across the Ardon. For the Allies, the situation at the end of June, though disappointing, gave little cause for serious concern. In all sectors, they held defensible lodgments and had beaten off numerous German counterattacks. The build-up of men and equipment, although now days instead of hours behind schedule, had yet progressed more quickly and efficiently than the Germans had been able to amass forces in defense. In this, air power had played a key role. In addition to those forces based in Britain, 31 squadrons were now flying from airfields in Normandy. This gave the Allies an invaluable edge. With the Luftwaffe reduced to skirmishing operations on the fringes of the battle zone, these frontline squadrons could operate with virtual impunity, providing tactical support to ground forces quickly and effectively. Other factors also operated in favor of the Allies. Throughout June, Hitler remained convinced that the Normandy landings would be followed by landings in the Pas de Calais. Though Rommel and Rundstedt both now regarded this as highly unlikely, Hitler refused to sanction any transfers from this sector to reinforce the Seventh Army in Normandy. A few days after the initial landings, he had ordered the launching of flying bombs from bases in the Pas de Calais. These, he believed, would quickly force the Allies' hand, resulting in a hastily prepared attack against superior positions and troops. The missiles brought a brief reign of terror to London.
bombarding the capital day and night for nearly three months. But they had little discernible effect on Allied strategy. Despite the elaborate campaign of deception, no plans had ever existed to attack the Pas de Calais in force. Ironically, of the many measures taken to combat the flying bombs, one in particular, heavy bombing of the launch sites, only served to further convince Hitler that an invasion in this sector was imminent. By the end of June, the Allied air and naval forces had transported a total of 850,000 men from England to France. These were deployed in 26 divisions, of which five were armored. To oppose them, Rommel nominally had around 20, of which eight were armored, most of them elite formations. Though many of these divisions were gravely under strength, short of weapons, transport and ammunition, they held strong positions and had proved more than capable of a protracted and bitter defense. To break the deadlock and to counter the defensive tactics of the Germans, the Allies were increasingly resorting to brute force, specifically the pulverizing force of massed artillery. The Bocage countryside of Normandy presented almost insuperable problems to the Allies. Their experience, training and equipment were manifestly unsuited to the kind of close quarters combat demanded by the nature and peculiarities of the terrain. The Bocage lent itself ideally to defense. The definition box country describes a region of patchwork fields, long established, bordered by dense hedges and narrow sunken roadways. Tanks lurked in the maze of lanes or were dug in as pillboxes. Often one tank, supported by a company of infantry, could command the line of advance of an entire enemy column. Mortar pits were dug and ranges precisely calculated well in advance. Hedges and ditches provided ideal cover for machine gun positions and concealed rifle points, and fields of fire were established over adjacent farmland. Though far more numerous, Allied tanks were no match for panthers or tigers. The Sherman was lightly armored compared to a tiger and massively outgunned by the tiger's turret-mounted 88. Time and again, in their advance through the Bocage, Allied columns were stopped dead in their tracks by the superior firepower of a solitary tiger. Once halted, the Allied column came under highly accurate and devastating mortar fire, further impeding its mobility and throwing it into chaos and confusion. To advance under these conditions, the Allied infantry had to use infiltration tactics, pushing forward small parties along the hedges or through the fields. If the Tiger's infantry support could be dislodged, it then became vulnerable to light anti-tank weapons, and because it was also restricted by the Bocage, these could, in theory, be brought to lethally close range. The Germans were masters of such tactics and employed them in countless local counter-attacks, but the Allies, as a rule, neither learned them nor favored them. 
Their preferred method of overcoming such a well-organized defense was to call on artillery or airstrikes. Yet often, the enemy was so expertly deployed that the bombardment failed and the line of advance remained checked, the awaiting columns systematically mortared from close range. During July, the Allies continued to batter their way south. Progress was slow, often agonizingly slow. On average, no more than a few hundred yards a day. Amongst senior Allied commanders, there was a growing sense of unease. They possessed a two-to-one superiority in manpower. In equipment, especially tanks and artillery, the superiority was massive. In the air, they were virtually unchallenged. Yet they were unable anywhere to achieve a decisive victory. Every field was a potential killing zone, every road junction a bottleneck, and every village a fortress. On July the 8th, the British launched a fresh offensive against Caen. The attack followed a massive aerial bombardment in which much of the city was reduced to rubble. On the following day, they reached the town centre but found the Orne bridges blown and the Germans firmly established amid the ruins on the far bank. Ten days later, the British tried again this time attacking out of the Orne bridgehead in a bid to encircle Caen from the northeast. Impressed by the destruction wrought on Caen, General Dempsey had ordered a saturation bombardment of the German positions. More than 4,000 aircraft combined with naval and ground artillery to batter great swathes of territory for nearly three hours. The main thrust of the offensive was launched by three armoured divisions, all attacking in echelon, out of the Orne bridgehead. These were supported by three infantry divisions, two Canadian and one British. The British advancing with the armour, the Canadians on the right flank attacking through Caen. Early British intelligence appreciations had indicated the presence of only three German divisions east of the Orne. All of them regular Wehrmacht formations and all exhausted after weeks of heavy fighting. But there were in fact five, two of them SS. The first, still relatively fresh, was the premier SS formation, while the 12th composed entirely of Hitler Youth volunteers, had proved itself the most formidable. Dempsey's offensive made good progress for only the first few miles, but the basic plan was flawed from the outset. Too much armor had been concentrated in the Orne bridgehead, and the tanks advanced in long columns inadequately supported either by infantry or artillery. By the afternoon, the Germans had recovered and stabilized the front. British attacks continued for a further two days with only modest gains, and by the 21st, the front was once again effectively deadlocked. While operations in the British sector continued to occupy the Germans, holding down most of their armor, the Americans were building up their strength in preparation for a breakout attempt in the West. The offensive 
codenamed Operation Cobra, was launched on July the 25th. In what had now become common practice, the attack was preceded by a massive aerial bombardment and supported throughout by concentrated tactical airstrikes. Under the weight of the onslaught, the thin German line quickly folded, and by the 27th, American tanks were racing through open country. On the following day, they reached Coutances, and two days later, Avranche, the gateway to Brittany and the west of France. The American breakout clearly signaled the beginning of the end of the Battle of Normandy. With American armor and mechanized infantry fanning out over the Brittany Plains, there was no longer any prospect of the Allied lodgment being contained. Common sense dictated a strategic withdrawal, at least to the Seine. But in a final act of suicidal folly, the remnants of 7th Army and Panzer Group West were fed into an offensive that would deliver to the Allies the decisive victory that had eluded them for so long. In early August, Hitler reorganized his shattered forces in Normandy, redesignating Panzer Group West as the 5th Panzer Army and creating Panzer Group Eberbach from formations looted from 5th Panzer and 7th Army. Fifth Panzer consisted of two armored divisions supported by infantry. Panzer Group Eberbach accounted for the remaining seven, though many of these were now so seriously depleted as to be incapable of anything other than static defense. These forces were nonetheless now ordered to undertake an offensive in cooperation with elements of Seventh Army attacking west through Mortain towards Avranche. Fifth Panzer was directed to hold the line east of the Veer. When reports of the German build-up reached Bradley, he deployed five infantry and two armored divisions in the Avranche corridor, at the same time maintaining the momentum of his own offensive to the south and east. The result was a foregone conclusion. Bradley's left held firm, while his armored spearheads pressed rapidly inland, threatening a massive encirclement of the remaining German forces west of the Seine. With most of the German armor committed to the Mortain counteroffensive, the British and Canadians were at last able to break out into the more open country to the southeast of Caen. On August the 16th, when they reached Falaise, most of 7th Army and its supporting formations were still west of the Orne. On the following day, with his forces in imminent danger of encirclement, Hitler reluctantly authorized a general withdrawal. Yet, as the trap closed, the German retreat quickly became a rout. Scattered units pressed frantically eastwards, merging gradually in a great tide of men, horses and armour. Overhead, Allied fighters and bombers ranged at will, flying thousands of sorties every day, strafing, rocketing and bombing the disorganised columns. For three days, SS units fought grimly to hold open a narrow corridor to the east. But although these actions enabled thousands of their comrades to evade capture, they could not alter the outcome of the battle. On the 19th, the British and Americans met at Chambois, 
closing the trap on 7th Army, on Panzer Group Eberbach, and on most of what remained of the 5th Panzer Army. Fighting continued for a further two days, with isolated groups escaping on foot through the Allied lines. But on the 21st, all further resistance was abandoned. Those remaining in the pocket, now leaderless, disorganized and shell-shocked, began surrendering in hordes. Defeat in Normandy was a catastrophe for the Wehrmacht. Of the 57 divisions stationed in the west in May, 40 had now either been destroyed or savagely mauled, amongst them many of the finest divisions in the German order of battle. By committing what remained of his forces to the Mortain counteroffensive, Hitler had effectively squandered his last opportunity to hold the line of the Seine as part of a phased withdrawal through northern France. Staking everything on victory, he had retained nothing in reserve for defense. When the gamble failed, the collapse was as comprehensive as it was quick. When the Allies reached Paris, they found it in turmoil. Pitched battles raged between retreating garrison units and bands of armed civilians. These clashes continued almost to the end of August, by which time a further 20,000 prisoners had been taken. From the Seine, the Allies pressed steadily north and east. Resistance was negligible. Not until they reached the borders of the Reich itself would they meet the kind of opposition that they had faced in Normandy, though by now, with the outcome of the war no longer in doubt, such resistance had become increasingly vain and futile. In the last months of the war, Germany would be squeezed remorselessly from the east and from the west. Through their victory in Normandy, the Western Allies had laid claim to an equal partnership with Russia in the inevitable post-war redrawing of the map of Europe. This alone would more than justify all the effort and sacrifice of the battle.